Hello, and a very warm welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Hugh Webster. I'm the Digital Communications Officer for Scotland The Big Picture, and I'm delighted to be chairing tonight's discussion, examining the transformative potential of reintroducing the links to Scotland. This evening's event is being brought to you by the Links to Scotland project, which is a partnership between Scotland The Big Picture, Trees for Life and the Lifescape project with a particular remit specific focus on looking at the benefits and the barriers to links reintroduction in Scotland. I'm sure most of you who are tuning in tonight already know a fair bit about the links. Uh, if I can just recap some of the basics briefly, uh, there are four species of links. The Eurasian lynx is the one that is being considered for reintroduction to Scotland. It is the largest of the four lynx species but it is still very much a medium-sized cat. To put that into perspective, it is about the size of a border collie, uh, or to look at it another way, it's an order of magnitude smaller than uh, a Kalahari male lion or a Siberian tiger, for example. However, it has been described as a big cat in a small cat's body, and it is very much a legitimate apex predator. It is capable of hunting animals as large as a red deer hind in the north of Norway. It frequently hunts reindeer. So it is an awe-inspiring and uh, very much, as I say, an apex predator. But tonight, we're not really wanting to go over the familiar ground of looking at the ecology of the lynx. We want to shift the spotlight a little bit away from the discussion that has been had in the past about the benefits that this apex predator might have for nature in terms of its effect on ecosystems and focus a little bit more instead tonight on what the effects might be for people, what might be the benefits for us. So before we dive into our discussion, just a brief bit of admin to explain how things will work this evening. Um, we have the chat function available. You're very welcome to chat uh, using that. However, if you have any questions, and I'd encourage you, please, there'll be a stage at the end when uh, you can ask questions. Uh, and if anything comes up during the course of our discussion, please just put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. If you want us to respond, put it in the Q&A box and we will get to those at the end. Uh, when we should have 15 minutes or so when we can uh, branch out and reach, talk to you guys in the discussion then. Okay, so onto our panel. Part of our, our job as advocates of links reintroduction um, is to try and understand as many different perspectives as possible. Uh, when we talk about these benefits and barriers and uh, our panel is perfect for that tonight. Uh, we have got, and I'm going to read this out so I get this right. We've got Patrick Laurie, he's a best-selling writer, a hill farmer with a passion for Galloway cattle and a conservationist with experience around Europe. He is also, by his own admission, something of a warrior with a particular horror of the insidious disconnect that sees us all increasingly separated from the rest of the natural world. We've got Matt Cross, a journalist, blogger, and rural commentator with a passion for field sports, who works for an environmental restoration charity focused on peat, wildflowers, rivers, truth, justice, and beauty. He recently traveled to Estonia to report on an elk hunt, and he plans to return soon for a wild camping trip with his daughter, going back into wolf country. And lastly, James Nairn, he is the lead for Scotland The Big Picture's Northwoods Rewilding Network, uh, where he coordinates a group of more than 50 landowners united by their commitment to rewilding. He has also travelled extensively around Europe looking for large carnivals and was recently in Norway where he learnt about their experience living alongside lynx and we'll be hearing more about that in just a moment. So gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you this evening if you'd like to join us online and thank you very much for, for agreeing to, to join this discussion. So Cards on the table, um, my personal viewpoints, uh, where I stand in all this is I, I do believe that Scotland will be better off with links. Um, I know many others feel the same way. We'll, we'll, we'll see how, how all of you feel as we go through the uh, discussion this evening. But James, I'm gonna start by coming to you. I know that you were, as we mentioned recently in Norway and you had the opportunity there to talk to Professor John Linnell, who's from the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research where they've got more than 30 years experience of uh, studying and conserving Eurasian lynx there in Norway. 
Can you tell us, I understood that he said to you that if we were considering reintroducing links in Scotland, it was very important that we did it for the right reasons and in the right way. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit uh, more on what you understood he meant by the, the right reasons for reintroducing links to Scotland? Hi, everybody. Um, well, I guess um, what I think they meant by what I think they meant by that really is really understanding the complexity of a reintroduction. Um, the whole process is not one that can be taken lightly. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be complicated. It's probably going to be controversial, and it's going to be resource intensive. And when you think in terms of a links reintroduction, it, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of reintroducing them to a forest or a particular site. But with the links, you need to really think on a county or, or regional basis because of their the the nature of their their territories. Um, I guess my, my my key takeaway really is I, I felt the Norwegians thought that we were doing the right thing by reintroducing links, but they the message was we need to be very careful with our claims and we need to know what we're letting ourselves in for. Right. And when you say we needed to be careful about our claims, what were the sort of claims that you felt uh, they were saying we needed to be careful about? Well, it's, I think it's fairly clear that, you know, we've got enough habitat and we've probably got enough prey species in the form of roe deer for, for lynx, but we shouldn't pretend that there are going to be absolutely no losses of, of sheep. Um, they might, lynx may not take anything like the number that are taken in Norwegian forest pastures, but they will take some and we need a robust mitigation plan and a compensation scheme. And we shouldn't pretend that there aren't going to be any bumps in the road. Um, some links will be hit by cars, some might be shot. There'll be difficult management decisions to be taken. And that can be challenging if, you know, they can be difficult when public opinion maybe thinks one way or the other. Um, and I think thirdly, we shouldn't fall into the trap thinking that links are a, um, a be all and end all solution for excessive numbers of, of road deer, um, where, you know, uh, lynx tend to kill a specific number of road deer and in areas of high density, it's not gonna make much of a difference. So we shouldn't oversell the ecological advantages, but we should, you know, reintroducing lynx is, is, is a good thing to do. There will be ecosystem benefits. And I think we need to be wary of really falling into the trap of reducing all species reintroduction to human benefit. We should look beyond that. Yeah, this is really interesting. That's set us up perfectly for tonight's discussion, actually, I think. But you've, you've highlighted this, um, this particular trap with the, the, the risk, I think, that sometimes um, we can build expectations beyond what the evidence base is there to to allow us to say conclusively about what the ecological impacts might be. We, we know that links will have some ecological impacts, but we also know those impacts vary around Europe and context is key to all these things. And so how links will particularly respond in the Scottish context is, is a little bit difficult to predict, I, I suspect. But I think the thing that I take away from that as well is that um, I think there is a, an issue where this debate has focused traditionally very much on these ecosystem benefits and this talk of trophic cascades and apex predators fixing, as you say, the deer problem and, and whether or not that, that is a, a, um, a prediction that we really want to hang our hat on. Whereas I think actually, if we're honest, there, there are equally or potentially more important reasons for, for reintroducing links than what I think of as boxed off as these sort of practical reasons of, oh, we need to reintroduce links because they would eat the deer and that would allow forest regeneration and that would lock up carbon and that would combat climate change. That, these are all valid, important reasons, but I'm not sure they speak to the, the reason which are, why I am really excited about bringing links back to Scotland. And I'm not sure that they are the, re, the motivation for a lot of people. I've actually got a quote on this topic, which I want to read out. Um, it's from George Monbiot, who I know divides opinion a lot, but I think he hits the, the nail on the head with this particular idea. And he says, I will not try to disguise my reasons for wanting to see missing animals reintroduced. 
It is not the desire to control floods or reduce erosion or hinder the spread of disease, though all of these might be useful side effects. My reasons arise from my delight in the marvels of nature, its richness and its limitless capacity to surprise, from the sense of freedom, of the thrill that comes from roaming in a landscape or seascape without knowing what I might see next, what might loom from the woods or water, what might be watching me without my knowledge. It is the sense that without these animals, the ecosystem is lopsided, abridged, dysfunctional. I can produce reasons scientific, economic, historic and hygienic, but none of these describe my motivation. And that's what I'd like to explore this evening. So Patrick, if I could ask you to chip in at this point, I know you've spent a lot of your uh, working life as a conservationist focused on curlew conservation, which might seem like a strange segue from talking about links, but I don't think anybody has ever sort of attempted to justify the conservation of curlews on the basis that they provide some fundamental ecosystem service or a busy locking up carbon some way. So do you think there's a, there's a valid case to be made that we need to rethink how we reframe why we're interested in conserving wildlife? Hello, Hugh, can you, can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear, Patrick. Brilliant. Um, yeah, um, I think we're interested in nature for all sorts of different reasons. Um, and find it's interesting that how far are we into the recording before we've quoted and read from from George Monbiot which in <laughs> itself is um yeah it, from lots of quarters acknowledging that this is a relatively inflammatory topic or can be a relatively inflammatory topic um it's amazing how quickly we can instantly run into issues that perhaps we we perhaps don't agree on um but actually it's it's a great book, interesting book, interesting writer, interesting ideas. Um, and I would recognize a huge amount of why I'm so passionate about curlew conservation in what he's just said there. Um, <clears throat> in as much as it's that slightly quantifiable, unquantifiable factor, which just makes that species shine for me. But the great thing about curlews, and you've used the expression there, keystone species, I would sort of meet your keystone species and raise you a flagship species in as much as not, um, not necessarily playing the same functional role, but curlews actually stand for um, farmland biodiversity in lots of ways and how we're using landscapes and people in landscapes, human beings. A huge amount of my work on curlews has got nothing to do with curlews at all. It's about understanding why people make the land use decisions they want to make on farmland. Um, if you've got curlews, you've probably got thriving populations of other species like brown hares or, or lapwings or in the uplands you might have black grouse so actually <clears throat> in a sense I'm always kind of looking over my shoulder with a, a little bit of embarrassment when people say uh, oh so you're interested in curlews because because that kind of narrows my view down and I, I'm always trying to push that back and say yes I'm interested in curlews because they allow me to have much wider conversations about loads about loads of other things and, and actually one of those things is wetlands, which you trace it, turn that around, wetlands linked to beavers. And so you'd look at the beaver conversation from the curlew end. A lot of these things sort of fire into one another. Um, but I suppose when you say how should we maybe reimagine how we look at our motivations, I think the, the biggest issue I come up, and you mentioned it slightly in my introduction, which a very generous introduction, um, we're living in a country where an enormous amount of people aren't that interested in any wildlife, full stop. Um, and so I'm really, I'm always really keen, to, I'm always really keen to avoid a narrative which ends up saying, uh, no, 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 don't be interested in those animals, you guys, be interested in these animals, when as a fact, the room is full of people who aren't interested in any animals. And, and in terms of resources and intention and, and the quality and the breadth of conversations we could be having, your interest in lynx, my interest in curlews, you and I are standing back to back in a room full of people who have interest in, in nothing to do with any of this stuff. So, so I, I'm cautious about potentially divisive angles as much as when we plunged in a slightly divisive point. Um, I certainly are, want, to, I, I, I want I, to come I, back I, to that, Patrick, that, that idea that you're touching on there about the sort of lack of interest that 
is, is maybe characteristic of a certain proportion of society. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely touch on that later. But I'm also, mm. you've done me a favor there in mentioning that uh, you, you talked with not only keystone species, but flagship species. And you talked about how for you, curlew are a sort of door into interest in, in all these other things. I, I am interested tonight in introducing a new term, if you like, to add to that pantheon of, of labels that we use for, for um, important species. And I think that, uh, and I'll be interested to hear your opinion on, on, on this term in a, in a moment, there, there is a case to be made that the lynx uh, might be something that I think of as a transformational species. So it's, it's not a keystone species in necessarily this definition, it's, it's different. It's not to say that it can't also be a keystone species and a flagship species, but what I mean by something that is a transformational species is that it fundamentally changes how we feel about a landscape when it is there versus when it is not there. And I think there's a relatively small list of species which transform our experience of a place fundamentally just by either knowing they're there or not there. And I'm, I'm happy to, to be shot down if you don't think that's a fair description, but I might come to you, Matt, actually, on this. And I know... You've just been uh, recently in Estonia and you've been in landscapes where there are wolves and where there are bears and where there are Eurasian lynx. And so I wonder, did that place feel different to you for, for having those species? Did it have a transformative effect when you knew when you were looking into those woods that there were those big apex predators out there? Yeah, of course it does. I mean, any, any landscape that has apex predators in it feels different. Um, you know, that as well as, as well as spending some time in Estonia, I used to live in Nepal and I lived in the South of Nepal, um, I, in an area which, um, is not the sort of mountainous part of Nepal at all. It's uh, sort of flat and, and heavily, heavily forested and had sloth bears and it had, um, leopards. And yeah, there is something different about a landscape with animals that can kill you, right? That there is. Um, there is an awareness. I've also spent a, a bit of time in Svalbard where there are polar bears, um, you know, and there's something that it's a very different experience sleeping in a tent in polar bear country from sleeping in a tent in sheep country, right? Uh, whether you see a polar bear or not, it feels different. I'm not convinced though. So I'm going to be the, I don't know what the, what the term is, the person who pours a bit of cold water on this. Sorry, Hugh. Sorry, right? <laughs> but here's, here's my big cup of cold water coming. I'm not convinced that it's links that make that difference. Now, that's not an argument against reintroducing links. I'm, I'm ambivalent on reintroducing links. I'm, I'm genuinely not sure, okay? Um, but would a forest feel different to me for having a lynx in it rather than a fox in it? I'm not convinced it would, to be honest. Um, would it feel different for having a bear in it? Yeah, yeah, I think it probably would. But the, the problem with this, I suppose, and tell me to shut up when I start rambling here, Hugh. Don't, don't hold back, right? No, but, this, this is exactly the cold water you were invited to bring on. Okay, okay, excellent. Um, it, the problem with, with the notion is that it, it's entirely subjective, right? If you had grown up in a landscape where, where large predators were a day-to-day -day reality, I, I don't think, I don't think you'd, you'd, you'd think twice about a lynx, right? Whereas maybe if you'd never seen anything scarier than a hedgehog, OK, a lynx would, would frighten the pants off you and would transform your relationship with that space. So I think it's a very subjective notion that there are certain species that, that transform our nation, our, our relationship with, with, with a landscape or with a, an ecosystem. And I'm, like I say, I'm not against lynx reintroduction. I'm, 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 I'm really interested in it. I'm really interested in it. And I'm, I'm certainly willing to hear the arguments about it and whatever. Um, but I'm not convinced that links are the thing that would transform that, you know, that, that would make those woods feel different. So you could walk out of my house and you could walk about half a mile, right? And then you could walk in trees practically all the way to Patrick's house, right? Which is quite a long way away. Um, I don't think walking through those trees would feel different if there were links in there. I think maybe it would if there were wolves in there. Maybe it would if there were bears in there. Links is, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. Okay. I'm willing to be convinced, but I'm not yeah. convinced yet. All right. Well, well let, let me try and convince you for a, for a moment. And then I might go, go to some other. I think I take your point entirely about the fact that it is subjective. 
And I think, as you say, if you have grown up somewhere where there are wolves and bears and you're told this wood has got links in or doesn't have links in, it may not be transformative for you. But the context that we're in in Scotland, that we're somewhere where we've had zero apex predators for hundreds of years, links may have been the last to hold on. We're not sure exactly when we lost our last links. You can sort of debate that. It's obviously difficult to know with such a cryptic, secretive species. But sometime in the last 500 years, the last links disappeared and, and the wolf maybe more recently than that. So either way, the fact is, if you brought links back now to Scotland, it would be different to just having foxes in the forest. I think it, this is an animal that can take down an animal as large as a red deer hind. There is no fox that is capable of doing that. and I was thinking on the on the uh, drive here tonight, actually, just looking out at the forest, I was thinking, imagine knowing there was a lynx in that forest. To me, that would make that forest feel dramatically different to knowing that there, to the same forest, just knowing it had foxes in it. And I'm perfectly happy to accept that it, it may not make everybody feel that way. And you say that you don't think it would make you feel differently about the forests around where you live to know there were lynx in there. I don't know, I think maybe, and the forests around where you live are one of the sites that have been identified as mm -hmm. potential reintroduction sites for lynx. Mm -hmm. If it happens, I certainly hope it does, it'd be interesting to come back to you and say, Matt, do, do those forests feel, feel different now that there's, there's lynx in there yeah. and whether, whether it, it came to pass that you did think they felt a bit different? You know, from, from a purely selfish perspective, I would quite like there to be lynxes out there. I think it's just cool. I just think it's cool that, you know, that there are these cool looking animals roaming about the place and that if you're incredibly lucky and you spend 30 years roaming around, you might catch a glimpse of one. Right. And I think that is that's a cool thing. Um, I, I think there are other concerns that make me ambivalent on the question of reintroduction. But, you know, I think it's cool and fun and interesting. <sighs> Does it transform a relationship with the landscape? Not convinced. So the, the jury's out on, on yeah. that, that effect. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, James, if we came back to you briefly on this one, because I know you've had a lot of experience um, in different landscapes around Europe, some with just lynx, some with lynx and wolves and bears. W what was your take on, on whether they felt transformatively different to, to a, a Scottish woodland with no apex predators in it? Well, we all, we all have different ways of getting our kicks, and I guess I, I'm in exactly that position over the last 30 years. I... I've spent my, my free moments trying to find wilder places, whether that's the, kind of the Swiss Jura or the Carpathian Mountains or Scandinavian forests or, or Baltic marshes. Um, I take Max's point in that it's difficult to break it down by species. So I definitely feel those Eastern or Northern European forests are different. Is it because they have lynx in them or is it because they have lynx, wolves, bears, boar, uh, beaver and elk they just somehow feel they do feel different um, I, I think there's a there's when you're walking in a forest with a lynx or if they were here for example I think you would live in hope of seeing one it's 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 not seeing one itself it's the possibility the the the, the possibility of something unexpected happening or, or and, and seeing a seeing an amazing animal like that. So in, in 2030 trips that I've made into kind of lynx habitat, I've been lucky enough to see a lynx once. And you know that that it that feeling was was spiritual. It was sort of atavistic. Um, and so I I I am not sure if transformed is the right word, but I think it, I think I think it would work. But it's different, and uh, and I think it's beneficial. Um, if, if they came back to Scotland. Absolutely. And I think part of what motivates a lot of interest in rewilding is this idea of bringing back things that are missing and that the fact that they're missing is something that a lot of people feel as a sort of almost physical loss, that, that sort of haunted landscape that you, you, you sense that these animals used to be there. I'm always cautious about using the word should, but that in a natural entirely natural situation you might say they would still be there but because of human persecution because of deforestation and loss of prey base in the case of the lynx they're no longer there and there's a great sadness for, yeah. for me certainly looking at those places thinking of what 
used to be there. And also, it's, we're not talking about prehistoric animals. We're talking about animals that are still extant in other parts of Europe, not very far away, but we have lost them. And there's a couple of words to, to discuss, the, to um, describe these emotions, actually, that I found. There's um, solastalgia, that you, you might have come across this term. It's defined as the sense of des desolation, detachment and grieving that occurs when people are confronted with irrevocable changes to landscapes that they feel connected to. And the phenomenon of ecological grief, the mourning of the loss of ecosystems, landscapes, species and ways of life. So this, this feeling of, of missing things that used to be there or losing things that are on the way out. Patrick, I'm, I come to you again, and I, and I know you don't like to be pigeonholed or you've suggested with, with this unique interest in curlies, but you probably feel a little bit of that um, with the, the sort of fading presence of, of um, curlies, if that's fair to describe that situation in Galloway. And I was wondering, what, what do you think about the idea about whether bringing links back would address those feelings of loss? Is, is that a fair sort of um, approach to think about it like that? I think it makes sense. I think it's it's a way of looking at it and in lots of ways, uh, putting a farming hat to one side and putting a, a, a writer's and a slightly more creative um, hat on for the other aspects of my life. Yeah, completely. That Those emotional arguments really chime with me. Um, but at the same time, there are entire vocabularies in languages of Western Europe, in fact, the Western world, in fact, the world, which relate to a sense that something's missing, a sense that something's um, not quite what it was. Um, but And that becomes quite a non-specific sense uh, to even to the point of the sense of yearning for something because you know you can never have it. So it almost it almost it almost starts to translate into the edges of, of kind of almost a, a profound human desire to have something that we feel we don't have. That's it's a, it's a there's something in there in in that kind of slight counter argument which kind of balances the can we mourn things that perhaps we have no hands-on experience with or that weren't directly ours are we born with this desire to return to the sort of primordial um state or um there's there's bits of that, that and i think probably we all sit on on various points on that spectrum from the no we absolutely can't we need to know it otherwise we can't miss it to the as human beings, we are essentially always doomed to want something that we feel we're missing. Um, but just to back on terms of some of the, the what your the discussion so far about the transformational stuff and that real excitement, that passion, that real desire to go and spend time with the wilderness. Um, I've been to Finland and Poland and Croatia looking for really, really wild places and really, really cool charismatic animals. And I've seen them the one thing I haven't seen is a lot of other British tourists going to these places to see these things. So, so, so there's, there's a question almost that I'd ask back to this group and this conversation is, is we're clearly, there's clearly an appetite to bring that kind of stuff to this country. And yet, if you live in the Southeast of England, you can fly on a plane and be there with a lot less hassle and convenience to, Finland to Croatia to Poland than it would take you to get to the highlands where there isn't this why aren't we accessing the really cool wilderness that's that's already there really affordable really accessible you can take whatever you want from it the food's great the culture's fantastic it's a great holiday why aren't we doing that but we do want it in this country so so that's 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 kind of a spin yeah. on the transformational stuff it's an, it's an interesting point you raise, and, and I don't know what the answer is off the top of my head, but what occurs to me is that sometimes we, when we talk about tourists, they, they, they tend to be creatures of habit. We're not always the most imaginative in terms of um, thinking about where to go on holiday. And I, I, sus I suspect there is a degree to which it just hasn't occurred to a lot of people in the same way that for a long time, nobody, it didn't occur to anyone to go up to the northwest of Scotland. And then somebody came up with the NC500 and then everyone was like, oh, you can, you can go up to the northwest coast of Scotland. There's all this stuff there. That, it was always there. And, and there clearly is huge demand for it because look how busy the NC500 is now. But it, it took someone to point it out and sort of publicise it. And, and I think we know from the experience 
of bringing white-tailed eagles back to the west coast and how popular they are on Mull now, attracting a lot of tourists there. We know from more historically looking at the reintroduction of ospreys to Lock Garden, how enormously popular that was. Tens of thousands of people flocking up there to, to see those ospreys. So there's no doubt in my mind that if we were to bring lynx back to Scotland, it would be a huge draw. Um, why that same draw hasn't sent people flocking to Romania, to the Carpathians, to Poland and Finland, I'm not sure. I think they're just not on people's tourist mental map to, to the degree that maybe, as you say, extolling their virtues, maybe they should be. And, and there, there tends to be a sort of short list of pe places that people think of more obviously. And, and exactly why that is, I, I can only speculate. But there's, a, this, there's, there's an interesting parallel of, I mean, we're very ready this time of year, we're very ready to go to Europe for sunshine and warm weather. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not ready to go to Europe to experience that. <gasps> A forest transformed by the presence of a bear um and, and i suppose perhaps it's easy to interpret that as like perhaps the demand's not there people aren't that actually fast about this like perhaps all of us around the table um yeah totally that's absolutely rings our bell and we've all around us traveled to see this kind of stuff but but when we talk later down the road about some of the funding mechanisms and the eco the, the ecotourism potential and all the opportunities that come out of this kind of stuff um we almost kind of we have to create the demand and the supply at once to say here's a really great thing we need to make it and you need to go without yeah. kind of testing the water to say actually this is really great continent europe right there yeah um let's go, you know let's go i come at it from a slightly different perspective as well is in that i don't really doubt that there is the demand there in the british public in terms of interest in wildlife you only have to look at how fond the british public are of like wildlife documentaries and they do travel to other places, maybe not so much to Eastern Europe to, to see bears and wolves, maybe because they're a bit harder to see than if you go to Kenya and you can see lions more easily, um, or to North America to, to some of those landscapes. But actually, increasingly in conservation, there's a lot of talk about carbon footprint and whether people should be traveling the world to see these things. And I think there's a strong case to be made that if we the advantage of having these things on our doorstep again is that you don't have to travel, you don't have to get in a plane and fly, even if it is just across the North Sea to Scandinavia, you can get the train up to Aviemore, or you can, you can get the train to Galloway and you can get out. No, no you can't. <laughs> I thought you were going to, you pulled me up on that. You struggled to get the train to Galloway, apparently. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but sorry, no, that's it's all it's all you, just you can get public transport of some yeah, sort of some sort of connections and and to have those things available on our doorstep, I think that there's more and more discussion that um conservation that is funded by tourism ideally is domestic tourism rather than international tourism. And I think it'd be a great shame if we were restricted in our sort of wildlife viewing uh, potential in this country, in that we were never able to access any of those dramatic. As, as Matt described them, cool things that, that are available elsewhere um, if we were to, 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 to focus exclusively on domestic tourism. But if I, if I can um, just close that door for a moment, the, the discussion of, of tourism, um, and go back a little bit to, to you were talking about the sort of fundamental, is there something about the human condition that, that makes us nostalgic for these things? It, there's a similar psychological phenomenon and I think that's quite interesting to think about with this uh the phenomenon of people reporting big cat sightings in the countryside that turn out not to have been big cat sightings I'm aware there have been genuine big cat sightings in the past I'm here in King Craig at the moment and th there was a puma captured in the 1970s in the Afric Highlands that, that lived out the end of its days in the Highland Wildlife Park here so that there have been genuine big cat um, escapees or releases into the British countryside occasionally through history but there have been an awful lot of reported big cat sightings sometimes attracting the attention of police with helicopters and marksmen and all the rest that turn out just to be domestic tabbies or um, nothing at all a, a, a cuddly toy and to me that speaks to another sort of fundamental part of the, the human condition is the, the desire to believe that these sort of wild things are out there and, and there's some sort of need for that, um, even when they they aren't, and and what you're looking at isn't one of those things. So, James, if I come back to you, what do you think that 
of that idea that what does that tell us about our need for, for big predators in our lives? Well, I, I'm not sure I really want to lift the, the lid on the Pandora's box of, of big cat sightings or the <laughs> ecology behind it. But I think, I, I, I guess there is, um, I, I'm not sure if that's the thing, but you know, certainly from a personal perspective, I think there's sort of a refusal to accept extinction or there's a, there's a reluctance to let species go. And I, I feel I can see that in myself, in, in my desire to, to go abroad and, and, and experience wilder landscapes. I think in my, in my desire to work for Scotland the Big Picture and the, a lot of the support that Scotland the Big Picture gets, I think there's a refusal to accept extinction and, and go down quietly. You know, I, I, I think that this, so we've lost so many of our native species and I think in the case of the lynx, it's almost a it's a historical wrong that we need to that we need to atone for, um, and, and it's not something that's um, beyond our ken. You know, with with lynx, there's been twenty plus reintroductions since 1970, varying degrees of success. It's it's something that we can do. It's just about the will to do it. So. Um, it's something that can be done. Yeah. So we touched earlier, I think Patrick mentioned briefly about this uh, this idea of connection with wildlife and whether we're in a minority as, as people interested in rewilding and um, tonight talking about the links. Whereas in the wider public, maybe there isn't always that much interest. And um, I wanted to come to you on this idea, Matt, because I know you and I, we've both spent uh, a time in our careers working as teachers. And um, when I was a teacher in England, I can remember talking to my students about pine martins and 95% of them had no idea what a pine martin was and 5% of them hazarded a guess that it might be some sort of bird. And I think there, there is this expression in, in teaching that if you can't see it, you can't be it. That's quite a popular um, expression now. And I wonder if there's also a sort of phenomenon whereby if you can't see it or if you're not aware that it's out there, you don't care about it. And that is something that is hindering the interest in wildlife in this country. That um, There's a, uh, a quote in the a bit of a shameless plug here, but for SBP's Riverwoods film, where Holly Gillibrand says people say that us young people don't care about wildlife. But maybe part of the reason we don't care about wildlife is because there's so little of it left. Do you think that that is something that chimes with your experience of kids do you think if there were links back in Scotland for example it would elicit greater interest in young people I, I don't know I don't know you know I mean like I said before lynxes are cool right lynx lynxes they, they're cool you know they've got big teeth and claws and they're kind of funky looking right so I, I'm sure there is a a, a group of of young people who would be drawn to that would be attracted to that and would that would engage them i'm sure that is the case do i think it would make a, a major contribution to sort of dealing with the disconnect between a lot of young people and a lot of wildlife no i don't because i think i think i i don't think that arises because we don't have lynxes okay and i think we have to look at why that has arisen why is it that we have a population who are so disconnected from their natural world in a lot of cases and obviously the people who will be listening to this or you know participating in this site are completely atypical completely atypical um so i think we have to think about why, why has that happened and i don't think it's happened because we don't have linkses right i i think there are set, a different set of social cultural historical whatever processes at work there um that, that have driven that. So th there would be young people who would be engaged by the idea of lynxes, yes. But you know, it, why aren't they at red kite feeding stations? Why aren't they out looking for the, the golden eagles that were introduced to the south of Scotland? Why aren't they standing at waterfalls watching salmon jump them? You know, why, why aren't they doing those things? I, I don't think that, that lynx are the missing part in that. I don't think there is a missing part. There's multiple, multiple missing parts in that. If I can go on a slight tangent, I promise you it is relevant, you right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go on a slight tangent. I spent most of last week, so I've just started a new job. I spent most of last week in and around 
um, former mining villages in East Asia, right? Really tough, deprived communities, okay? And that have a, a very, not a natural landscape, but a, an unpeopled landscape right on the doorstep, but are completely disconnected from that landscape. And so when I was spending hours and hours and hours driving about all these back roads between Del Mellington and New Cumnock and all these places the other day, and I was thinking, would lynxes reconnect these people to this landscape? And I'm not convinced they would. I don't think that's what's missing. I think there's been a whole historical process that's gone on there um, that, that has disconnected people, including young people, but a whole lot of people from landscape. And that's what we need to try and, and work out and address. And we need to look at... Like to go back to Estonia, Estonia, Estonian people, in my experience, have an incredibly strong relationship with their landscape, right? Incredibly strong. They feel it as a fundamental part of their identity, is, their, is the, the natural world, their natural landscape. Now, why is it that so many people in Scotland don't have that and so many people in Estonia do, all right? And I'm not convinced that the presence of links in one of those countries is the difference. I think there's there's more to it than that. And I think with our young people as well, there's, there's more to it than that. But would it help? Yeah, I think it probably would. I think there are kids who would be engaged by links. Um, yeah. I suspect yeah. you're right, Matt. I think you're you're right to, to pour cold water on the idea that if we reintroduce links, it will magically transform the entirety of our societal attitudes to nature mm -hmm. and suddenly everyone will be fascinated. But also, I, I strongly believe that it will have some effect. And you talk about those communities that you've gone through in Ayrshire. If they knew that there were links in the woods down in Dumfries and Galloway, I, th I think it would inspire some interest. And certainly a percentage of the kids. I can, and it probably depends on the age group. I do a bit of work with uh, an environmental charity, environmental education charity in Southern Africa. And we find that there's a certain age of kids that you can reach where they're old enough to they, they haven't fully formed their sort of worldview yet but they haven't got cynical yet mm -hmm. and if you hit that sweet spot you can really capture the imagination of, of kids and something like links you say why aren't they watching red kites why aren't they watching salmon all those things are cool but i think there's a spectrum there and i think links is probably a step up in terms of how exciting it is and and how thrilling it could be to a kid to know that this big toothy as you describe big poured furry cat was uh, was stalking the woods i think that is yeah, more exciting. here's the thing you right i can with pretty good accuracy walk down the road and i can say there's gonna be salmon jumping that waterfall today and i can get the kids out of local primary school and we can stand and watch them right what would be the chances of us being able to do that with a lynx like if you think how many lynxes, lynxes, lynx, i don't know i'm sorry i'm mixing up here right but yeah. how many link i right we could release into the southwest of Scotland. Patrick and I both live in the southwest of Scotland, though quite far apart, but we both live in the southwest of Scotland. If you think how many of them we could release in the southwest of Scotland, the chance of anybody actually, any individual person actually experiencing a lynx is pretty small. You know, it's pretty small. And I think, I, I yeah, I wonder why they'd be drawn to things that are so inaccessible when they're not drawn to things which are more accessible. And I get the lynx are cooler than salmon. I get that. And arguably cooler than red kites. Get that too. Okay. But I'm not convinced that they will make this connection. This is a, this is a common um, complaint, if you like, or objection that people say about links. They're like, why do you want to reintroduce links? You're never going to see one. And this is where I go back to it. It's as much about the knowledge that that very cool animal, very beautiful, very inspiring, very, very awe inspiring animal could be watching you when you're walking down that path in the woods you know that it's it, you could feel the sort of there's almost a sixth sense it goes back to that atavistic thing that james was talking about that primal sense that there is a predator out there that is no threat to people but it's a predator that is big enough to take down a roe deer a red deer hind it's it makes the place feel different and then maybe you don't see a lynx but you see its tracks in the snow or you, or you come across a carcass that has been killed by a lynx or you just hear a jay alarm calling in the woods 50 meters away and you think geez what what caused that jay to start alarm calling and i think all of those things would be exciting for kids i think i could take a bunch of kids into the woods never see a lynx and they could all come back very excited about the fact they've been in a wood where lynx were you know what i think you could take a bunch of kids into a wood and show them a big red deer stag and they'd be amazed and excited by it 
So that's a super there. cool thing too, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's a, and we're living with them. There's, there's, they're all over the flipping place. There's loads of them, right? So, you know, I, I, I don't. I think there are species there that are capable of connecting those things up. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm the Grinch in this, aren't I? I really am. I'm sorry, right? But you're um, playing your role perfectly, Matt. Great, great. It'd be very so, boring if we all agreed. Um, I. I think there are already species there that could do that. I mean, a red, a red stag, a big red stag is a spectacular animal and it could, it could mess you up if it wanted to, right? So there are things out there for people to be amazed by and scared of and then not being. So would the lynx do that? I don't know. don't know. James, let me, let me come back to you. I think the Scottish government has just announced today a, a new biodiversity strategy for... for 2045 or something i think is the, the latest sort of target date and um there's 27 actions on there that they've identified they want to do i did a quick search of the document using the control f function on my computer and i checked links are not mentioned do, do you think that's a, a missed opportunity from the scottish government do you think if if the scottish government was to sort of commit to at least exploring the idea in, in more detail that that could re really lay down a marker of, of sort of intention, if you like, to, to address the biodiversity crisis by bringing back such an iconic, whether you call it transformative, whether you call it a flagship species, but, but something that is clearly um, a very high profile, would be very high profile and a very public marker and declaration of intent. Well, it's, it's always been a real source of shame to me that Scotland ranks so near the bottom, I think in the bottom 12% of the biodiversity intactness index, um, and that we've got declining species abundance. Um, so I think if a green light were given to Link's reintroduction, it would be symbolic. Uh, and I think it would, it would indicate a kind of a psychological turning point that we are alive to the biodiversity crisis and that we're serious about doing something about it. So yes, I don't think it would be ecologically transformative, but I think it would be symbolic. And I, I, I do think it would be a beacon if, uh, if the Scottish government were to give serious consideration to a, to a Lynx reintroduction. Yeah, indeed. I live in hope. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm, in just a moment, I'm going to come to, to the there's various questions in the box I, I can see. But just briefly, I wanted to, um, to cover one other question for you, Patrick, and you talked to I quoted George Monbiot earlier. I'm going to quote you now, Patrick, for, from your excellent book, Native. Um, and this is just to uh, look at the idea that um, whether we're able to value something that isn't wholly positive. So in the case of the links, part of the objections that we sometimes hear about links reintroduction is there are obviously costs that are disproportionately felt by certain people in society, primarily likely to be sheep farmers. Um, and there's another species that we already deal with, which has both costs and benefits, and, and that is the one we've mentioned earlier, the, the fox. And you, you wrote in your book, Patrick, gather a dozen old folk together and get them talking about the fox. After half an hour, they'll be cheering and laughing at the wild cheek of him. And by Christ, he's got a nerve. But if a fox walked into the room at that moment, he'd be torn to shreds. What do you think, Patrick, about this idea that we're able to sort of simultaneously um, admire something but also vilify it and do you think it's fair to say that we're better at doing that with species which we're familiar with like the fox than ones that we are unfamiliar with when we're talking about reintroducing species whether it was white-tailed eagles on, on Mull uh, or on the west coast to begin with or potentially in future lynx that's uh, that's an interesting one and uh, uh sort of as a parallel strand I think the fox is a particularly baggage laden creature but if you look where I am in the southwest of Scotland over the last 20 years probably we've seen the return the enormous resounding return of two very similar species the badger and the otter have come from effectively non-existence to pretty stable if not super abundance now for no given that they were gone and they had no bias there was no kind of shared collective memory of what these animals were uh and if there was a memory it was probably similarly negative on both sides um badgers now are pretty noisily worried about and otters are universally adored 
So th those two animals have both surged back into, into our lives and one has gone downhill and one has gone uphill in terms of how we view it. Um, my, con my concern, and particularly with an event like this, uh, and I, like Matt, I'm pretty ambivalent about links. I love the idea of them and I get all the kind of difficult to quantify excitement about being around these animals. But also I'm from a sheep farming background. I sheep I stand with hill sheep. That this is this is that's that's what I'm for. Um there's a tiny little part of me thinking in the middle of this conversation, and I almost kind of bounce the idea back to you, Hugh, is do, do you care if farmers end up liking them or not? Surely Surely you need you, you need farmers not to act against links. But I mean, just recently we had uh, a big uh, red kite reintroduction project that went on in Galway. And a lot of money was spent on the word inverted commas, uh, education of stakeholders. And I was at a meeting quite recently where local people who uh, local uh, conservationists who'd reintroduced the kites back to Galway said they did a lot of education work. And actually now there's no opposition to kites. Yeah, that doesn't mean necessarily people have bought into kites. It just means people have given up moaning about it. And, and actually, you've now got a big group of stakeholders who feel a bit disempowered, a bit less interested in nature, a bit less engaged with their ability to get hands on and practical with conservation. And that feeds back into when I'm then working with farmers and landowners, trying to get them engaged in conservation, they feel a little bit less like they've got skin in the game because People don't really listen to them. So, I mean, in, in a sense, I wonder where your question comes from here a bit, Hugh. I mean, of course, we'd love farmers to love this. Turns out a lot of them don't love this. Yeah. But does this project now, through an event like this, get such momentum that it steamrolls farmers? And what do we then do with them? What Me, us, farmers, what do we then do with a whole tranche of people who didn't want this, ended up getting it anyway, and then as a result, all the connections we're talking about building with school kids and bringing people in to be connected with nature, we're basically cutting out a stakeholder group Yeah. by exchange. So, so to, my question is slightly back at you, Hugh. I mean, yeah. how, much, how much seriously does it matter in this consultation? I think, what, I mean, basically, you've, we're getting towards the end of this webinar here, and I feel like what you've done there is lay the groundwork almost for an entire separate webinar because that is such a big <laughs> question in terms of uh how you manage the the conflict with, with the links and we're getting away a little bit there we're at risk of getting away a little bit of the thing that we want to focus on today about the, the sort of potential transformational effect um does it matter to me yes it does matter to me is, is it as important to me as, as bringing the links back if i'm brutally honest uh, that is obviously my main interest is in the links rather than in hill farming, whereas your interest is probably more in hill farming than in the links, if, 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 if I was really pinned to the spot. However, I also do believe that there are benefits for farmers that could accrue from having links back in the landscape for diverse reasons, um, whether that was because it helped to uh, reinvigorate their communities because of those sort of uh, transformative effects that I've described, keeping young people in the communities, attracting tourists, making the whole community healthier, making the ecosystem more uh, interesting and exciting for young people. Th those are benefits that farmers would benefit from as well um, and are important to them. And there are, there are other benefits that we could talk about as well. I would like to save that for another day. If, if that doesn't look like I'm dodging the bullet too much, um, Patrick, because- it's, it's not, it's uh, not, it's it's not a bullet. So actually from my perspective, as a, a mixed hill farmer, somebody who's really keen to keep farmers in the hills, I can see there's a really good business case for doing it. And actually from a personal perspective, fine maybe ideal would be for cattle so i'm not less likely to suffer here there's lots of pieces to the puzzle here i'm actually probably on balance in favor of uh in favor of links but i live in a community that if they don't incredibly are incredibly hostile to the idea either they're either incredibly hostile to the idea or they simply can't see why anybody would be having conversations because as we said earlier in the freezing galloway where we're talking about reintroducing links we haven't got a train to come to the in Galloway. There's no cinema. The pubs are all shutting. Um, th those are the kind of conversations that, that that we're more likely to be having in the in the if we had a pub. That's where we. That's what we'd be talking about. May I chip in, Hugh, or do you need to move on? Uh, 
Uh, I'm conscious that we're, we're okay, carry on. Sorry. I've asked people to, to ask questions and, and we're running out of time. I'm not exactly sure what happens if we run over the hour slightly, but we should probably keep to, to the planned um, timetable. Um, so I'm going to go to the Q&A box. Thank you very much to all those people who, who have asked questions. Um, let me run through the, the um, just starting at the top. Uh, somebody's written before the links. This is Dominy Bowen. Before the links can be reintroduced, what further information is needed to be acquired, and what questions need answering to ensure the smoothest transition for both animals and humans? If I, if I would probably, if I answer that very briefly, I think we've we've touched on it there with that um, point that Patrick has raised at the end, and I think probably the questions that need to be answered at this point is how you would practically manage that potential conflict with farmers as, as the largest um, likely barrier to lynx reintroduction. I wanted to talk a little bit this evening about uh, the um, hunting community map. I'm sorry I didn't get to, to touch on that and, and how, how maybe you think lynx might be viewed there, but um, the, the greatest objections tend to be in those communities. So I think in practical terms, we need to explore what it would mean for those communities and how those potential conflicts can be mitigated in a way that is fair uh, and, and just. Uh, there is a question for Matt here from the Muller Niona Community Trust. Matt, if we already had bears or wolves, would you feel differently about reintroducing an apex predator like the lynx? Um, uh, right, this is going to be very unsatisfactory answer. Sorry about this, Muller Niona Community Trust. But I don't know because I don't know how I feel about reintroducing lynx. So I, I don't know how I would feel because I still I, I still can't quite make my mind up on the whole issue myself. Uh, I, I'm probably somewhere not quite as favourable as Patrick, but not far away from him. Um, so I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. Um, a question for Patrick. Is the southwest of Scotland the best place to introduce links, given the extent of commercial forestry? And would it help to stop everyone focusing on the highlands when it comes to ecological restoration? I know that's a subject close to your heart, Patrick. What do you think? Um, I can see there being uh, reasons to, to bring links to the southwest Scotland, but it also, I mean, having done some work with the south of Scotland Golden Eagle project, um, the kind of habitats those birds are using as they're flying around the southern uplands, even as we speak, are being converted from productive prey-filled habitats into commercial forestry. So um, the Vries and Galloway and the south of Scotland is kind of eating itself to a point of destruction at the moment. Um, so I would be very wary about, about, uh, about tossing uh, a big conservation project into the middle of that, as much as, as much as actually I do think we would have been, and perhaps are now, but may not be for very much longer, a good place to, to have links. Yeah. yeah. Um, so somebody has asked, relating to this same topic of conversation, speaking as a retired livestock farmer and conservation ecologist, what compensation is being proposed for any potential livestock sheep losses? To the best of my knowledge, the conversation has not got to the point where anyone has um, laid out any concrete um, compensation schemes, but there are various different models around Europe. In um, I think it is EU law that compensation has to be paid for um, livestock losses. What level that compensation is set, is set at is a bone of some contention. Often there are bureaucratic hurdles that upset livestock farmers as well. And the other model that is used in Scandinavia is, is conservation payments, where people are paid to coexist with, the, with um, predators uh, and they can then invest that money uh, in mitigation strategies uh, to avoid losses or they can just pocket it and take their chances but um, again that's probably a discussion for another another day. It's, it's also just very briefly Hugh a very very simplified answer if you say if I went into your house just now and killed your dog and gave you 500 quid because that's what it was worth um, you probably would still be a little bit miffed because it's not just it's not just the financials that's that's behind it. But that's, that's, that's a recurring theme that comes up. It's useful just to, to, to mention that. No, thank you for highlighting that. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there is a, a real risk when, when people just say, well, if we just organise compensation, then that will solve the problem. Whereas, uh, as you rightly say, there's a, there's a lot more at stake than just the financial value of the animal. You can talk about the breeding uh, genes that could be lost as the stress and trauma, um, both to people and the other animals. Um, so, so there's a lot more to consider than just the financial. Thank you, Patrick. Um, all right, I'm conscious that we need to, to, to wind down. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, contributing to this discussion with varying levels of scepticism and uh, agreement, this, but that is why uh, we wanted you to, to, to weigh in on this and, and um, properly 
um, scrutinized this idea that maybe lynx could be a transformational species. I don't know uh, whether our audience are convinced one way or the other. Um, there are a lot of questions I am seeing in the, the Q&A box that relate uh, more to uh, lynx biology and, and, and these questions in general, both that we've touched on there with the livestock loss issues. Uh, if you are interested, want to know more about the lynx, you cannot do better if I can give a little plug for uh, this book, The Lynx and Us, which is available uh, on the Scotland Big Picture website, that is scotlandbigpicture.com. Uh, it is written by Dr. David Hetherington, who is, I think, recognised as probably the UK authority on the links and uh, everything that you could want to know about uh, not just the links uh, potential in the UK, but about the, the different contexts in Europe where, that, where there are problems with livestock, where there are no problems with livestock. Uh, different models uh, is, is all in there, as well as stuff about uh, tourism and uh, culture and um, human engagement as well. So I thoroughly recommend that if you haven't got it already. Um, please also um, sign up to the Scotland Big Picture newsletter if you would like to hear more about these sorts of events or to follow uh, this ongoing discussion. Uh, if you follow the links to Scotland hashtag, uh, then you can find out more as the conversation continues. And clearly, as we've seen, there is still more talking to be done. Uh, a thank you to Matt and Emma, two of the Scotland Big Picture people working behind the scenes this evening to make sure everything ran smoothly. Uh, as I say, I don't know if, you, if you've been convinced, but hopefully at the very least uh, you have, will go away from this evening thinking there's more to think about than just the uh, practical, if we go back to the ecosystem services uh, arguments that are, that are often made in terms of links and, and maybe making the case for the beauty, the inspiration, the thrill and excitement that this incredible animal could bring back to our country. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Good night.